family, if you have experienced a major loss through the death of a loved one, Grief Share can assist in the process of healing. Grief Share is a 14-week program where you can share your journey through grief with others who have experienced similar losses. During these biblically-based meetings, you will learn to understand your grief experience while exploring ways to grow emotionally and spiritually through the process. This group covers a variety of topics related to loss, including is this normal, the challenges of grief, the journey of grief, grief, and your relationships. Grief Share meets Monday nights at 6 p.m. in room number three. Sign up at ccbeaumont.org under events. Would you like to learn how to better study your Bible? Would you like to receive tools that will help you improve your time studying the Bible? Our Equip class will give you many, many tools that will improve your time in God's Word. This class is going to meet on Mondays beginning on February 19th at 9 a.m. in Room 3. Sign up today at ccbeaumont.org under events. Ladies, do you want greater knowledge and wisdom to help you honor God in your everyday life? Join the women of Calvary Chapel Beaumont as you guys walk through the book of Proverbs to find help to live God-shaped lives. In this study, you'll learn to apply God's principles to your daily lives. In these groups, you'll discuss what you learned about God, what you learned about yourself, and how to apply God's Word to your life. This Bible study will take place Tuesdays at 9 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. And guess what? Child care is available in the morning sessions. Hey, ladies. Are you single and desire great fellowship with like-minded women? I want to encourage you to join the CCB Ladies Singles Ministry as they gather for intimate conversations about life and the Word of God. You can sign up today at ccbeaumont.org under groups and start making new friends with common interests. Church family, we would love to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, you can fill out a prayer request card in the sanctuary or you can email prayer at ccbeaumont.org. And even if you can't come to the sanctuary, you can also join the prayer team on Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. in the sanctuary. You can also pray throughout the week for each request by using the Church Center app. Through the app, you can sign up for a prayer group, receive the weekly prayer request, and even send your own request to the rest of the group. It's a great way to keep connected with your church family. We hope you love to worship the Lord. To worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings, you can drop them in the offering boxes on the sides of the media booth, or you can visit ccbeaumont.org and click the Give tab to give online. You can also mail them to the church office. As we get ready to worship, please check your cell phone and make sure it's silent, as this will help us cut down on distractions. Remember to preach the gospel and love one another. Well, good morning all you freezing people. <laughs> I've heard it's cold outside. I haven't been out there, but <laughs> you're looking at, <laughs> I'm glad to be inside. Well, let's, why don't we all stand? We're going to pray. And uh, God, we just ask you today that you'd come and help us sense your presence, Father. We know you're always with us. We thank you that you're faithful, Lord, that you have a plan today, Lord, to put your word inside of us. Help us be ready to receive, Father. We pray for the anointing on Pastor Jim today, Lord, and we also pray that you bless Pastor Henry, who's uh, ministering down in Orange County today. Bless him and Shondell as they're down there. Father, we give you thanks, Lord. We ask you to help us open our hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Cause I can start again. Creator God, calling me your friend. Sing praise my soul to the maker of the sky. Sing along, God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Oh, sing a song of hope, sing along, God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Well, greet some of your neighbors.
Psalm 84, verse 1 and 2 says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And then down in verse 10, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So we're going we're gonna to sing, sing that uh, scripture now.
and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your court than thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's watered to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands of swear. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands of swear. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day. Amen. Amen. So be it. And God, ever give us that perspective in life that better is anything with you than any other thing elsewhere. God, you are the highest, the greatest, the best. God, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for demonstrating that love that while we were lost in our sins, you demonstrated it through your death on the cross, God. Praise you for being the Lamb of God who is the perfect sacrifice who takes away our sins, Lord. We're free, we're forgiven, we're appointed unto heaven. Our destination is sure, God, based on what you have done. Thank you for the extension of your grace into our lives, God, and we worship you this morning. God, bless those this morning who need a touch from your hand, whether it's a cold or whether it's cancer, God. Would you touch your people and raise them up according to your will that you may be glorified even in these things in their life, God. Give them encouragement in their soul that comes from your spirit that nothing in this world can overcome because you've already overcame. God, help our hearts to be tuned into your word this morning. Help our minds to be given to the things of you. May we remain open as we continue to worship you through the study of your word. We pray these things and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name, all God's family said, amen. amen. And that's a lot of God's family this morning. Hey, if you have a seat next to you, if you could just slip your hand up real quick. We got some people outside who love Jesus so much. There's lots of seats here. Um, if you're outside and you're braving the elements, come on in if you want to. There are some seats in here. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I, I see that hand. I see that hand. Um, <laughs> Thank you for your response this morning. A couple announcements, uh, the first of which is I'm not Pastor Henry Lundy. <laughs> so if you're here for the first time, stay tuned till next week, right? Come back and see the pastor man. Um, he's away. He will be back next week. My name is Jim Shane. For those of you who don't know me, it is my privilege to be here with you this morning. Second announcement is that we are running an equipped class. Uh, pastor Henry mentioned it last week. Do you remember? He said, you'll get to learn how to study the Bible. And you guys all went, yeah, oh, yeah, that's great. You'll learn how to teach the Bible. And everybody went, oh, that's wonderful. Then you'll learn how to get in front of your peers in the class and speak. And everybody went, not me, <laughs> not me. 
There's lots of applications to this equipped class. It's going to be on Mondays. It's offered in the morning. It's also offered at night. For those of you who are retired, can come in the morning. Those who have to work, come out Monday night, and you'll be equipped, literally, according to the word of learning how to rightly divide it or teach it accurately, understanding it properly. Think about the broad spectrum of application that has. You can open the Bible in your home and teach your family. You could do a small group. If a friend have a question, you can take them to the scriptures and go verse by verse. You will grow in your understanding of the knowledge of God's word, and you will be secure. And when you get up and teach, all it's going to be is love, love, and more love. So come on out Monday night. Mark your calendars. It does meet here, and it starts, I believe, the 19th. Is that what it says? Mondays. Okay, it doesn't say that. You lied to me. It starts on the 19th. The 19th. So mark your calendars for the 19th. Come on out for that equipped. And do not be afraid. So with Pastor Henry being gone, we are going to stick to our regularly scheduled program. We are going to be continuing on the book of 1 Thessalonians. My assignment this morning is to cover the first five verses of chapter 3. So turn to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Did I get you? <laughs> Acts, chapter 17. Because we have time this morning, we are going to be looking at some very endearing words that the Apostle Paul is going to say to these people in Thessalonica who became like his very children. So I want to go back because we do have time this morning to read through the context in which this church was started. Because understanding the context and the background is going to give you a real understanding as to why he speaks the way he does, as to why he uses the words he chooses, as to why he's so affectionate in what he says. And speaking of speaking affectionately, this is a public service reminder for all of you men, 10 days from now is Valentine's Day. So you've got some time yourself to be thinking about some affectionate words, some things. Oh, yeah, somebody's excited already. I like that. <laughs> somebody's been thinking. And if you wait to the end, Ben, yes, you know, all the good cards are gone. So go this week and do something nice for your wife. As Pastor Henry would say, let's get back to the message. So Acts chapter 17 sets the background and gives us the context for what we're going to look at this morning. I know he's mentioned it before about how it was three weeks, how it was a riot, but I think it'll do us well to read these first 10 verses of Acts chapter 17 to set the stage for what we're going to look at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. So beginning at Acts 17, let's pick it up at verse 1 where it says, They passed through Amphalus and Apanala. They came to Thessalonica. That's where the Thessalonians lived. And they were there in the synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths, three weeks, reasoned with them from the scriptures. He's explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Sounds a lot like the equip class to me. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. So he preached the gospel from the scriptures, focused on the person of Jesus, and a lot of people responded to it. And it would have been great if it ended there, but it did not. They had results for sure, but they also had resistance as we continue to read on in verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded becoming envious, they didn't like it that so many people were going after Paul. They took some evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. Jason is where they were staying, Paul and his team. So they thought to bring out the people, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason has harbored them. He welcomed them. These are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying, there's another king, Jesus. 
and they troubled the crowd and the rulers. And when they had heard these things, so they, when they had taken a security or literally posted bail, took money from them, essentially robbed them, extorted them, they let them go. So if you flip back now to 1 Thessalonians, you see that Paul, when he was there, went into the city, entered the synagogue, as was his custom, and began to show them from the scriptures that Christ had to suffer. Because in recent history, no one would have soon forgotten the life of Christ and the uproar it caused and the crucifixion that happened. And this movement was taking place where people were saying, although he died, he's still alive. And this Jesus is the one from scripture all the way back to the beginning of whom you've been looking for. And he had three Sabbaths, three services to reason with him. Doesn't seem like a lot of time, but if you don't have much time, but yet you talk about the right person, it can have a big impact. Paul was focused on Jesus Christ from the scriptures. And although he didn't have much time there, it left an eternal impact. And the church was born. A multiple group of believers came to faith. But these relationships that he formed with these new Christians were, sh were cut short because of turmoil and chaos. Because the envy of the religious leaders didn't like that their enrollment might be dropping, giving might be down, likes and views and subscriptions on YouTube were probably going to go in the toilet. So they hated the Apostle Paul. They were envious of him. And this hostility erupted, and they dragged, they did a search of the house trying to find him, but they were well hid. So they dragged out the owner of the house, threatened him, and some of the brothers took money from them and sent it home. And then at night, they sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. You got to get out of here, Paul. They're going to kill you. It's too hostile. And they sent him away. So imagine if you're the apostle Paul, and you're walking at night with Silas being very quiet, crouching down on the road when you see somebody or think you hear something, trying to get away. Or imagine if you're those Thessalonians where you've come to faith and you've discovered that Jesus is real and for three weeks church has been like you've never seen it before. And then all of a sudden something happens between that third and fourth week and it's called affliction. And now you're maybe second guessing going, wait a minute, wait a minute. I agree with this truth intellectually that Jesus is the Christ from the scriptures. But I'm not so sure and I have to think twice if I'm going to follow him practically because this looks like it might cost me something. This is a hostile environment, not into which they were born, but which they were born again into. So you look at that and then come back to 1 Thessalonians. And let's look at chapter 2, verse 17 to set the context as we get into our passage this morning. But in verse 17 of chapter 2, he says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Pastor Henry mentioned this last week, that it would be strange for us to use this first century language. That if I were to look at my brother and say, I'm glad you're here. All week long, I've been affectionately longing to see your face. <laughs> I mean, you'd be like, hmm. Maybe put your arm around your wife and squeeze her tight. <laughs> although the words sound interesting to us, although in 10 days, guys, that's fully acceptable. Okay, go ahead and make sure you, you pull out some stuff like that. Although those words we don't use, we should still have the same heart. I should say, brother, it's great to see you. We've been praying for you. I'm glad you're here. How are you? A right? little more appropriate for our age. But the heart shouldn't change of having compassion for a fellow brother 
or a believer. And Paul even goes so far to say, you're my pride, you're my joy at the revelation and coming of Jesus Christ. That he saw himself as an agent of God, that when Christ came or he came to Christ, he wanted to be like the one who was handed the ten minas. And say, look, master, look, master, you're not going to believe what happened. You gave me ten, I got ten more. And he wanted to present these believers to the Lord Jesus Christ as a perfect bride, not having spot or wrinkle. This leads us to our first point this morning, which is having genuine affection. Having genuine affection. He says when we could no longer endure it. In other words, he couldn't take it anymore. He had fears for these people that were legitimate because of the way he left, the circumstances surrounding his departure, but he got to leave. They had to stay in that. And they were expected to grow in the midst of this hostility and persecution. And Paul was not only an evangelist. He wasn't just concerned with going to the back room and counting the number of decision cards. He wanted to make sure that there was not only a breadth to the ministry, but there was a depth to the character of the people. He wanted to make disciples of these people so that they would be strong in the Lord and not give up. He saw these people literally as his own. Now, you parents, do you remember when you brought your babies home? Do you remember when this concept became a reality and they handed it to you? No instruction book. Just, oh, it's beautiful baby. Good luck. You're checking out now. You have to leave. And you're like, okay. And you're hold, remember holding your child in your hand. You're, the, for the first time, you're going, wow, this is mine. This is, this is mine. This is, this is a part of what God did. And he, this is a part of me. And I remember holding my kids, our second son, he, he was born 11 minutes after we checked in. True story. You know why? Because dad had one before and he thought he knew what he was doing. First time in the hospital, it took forever, right? And you're like, I know how this works. You're in contraction, let's stop by Subway on the way. True story. And there's a yogurt shop next door, so let's get some of that too. Frozen yogurt. This might have to tie me over for a couple days because hospital food, no bueno. <laughs> so we check into the room and, you know, my wife's doubling over, right? I don't know if this is kind of how it works, I guess. That's how the first one was. The doctor comes in and just calls everybody into the room and asks me to step outside and get out of the way. Right? Because it wasn't the, the room, it was the check-in room. They bring everything in. Everybody comes in. Next thing I know, the doctor walks out and hands me this boy and puts it in my arms, and I'm standing in the hallway going, wow. <laughs> my wife's in there, and I say, hey, babe. She's all, yeah. <laughs> Looks just like his brother. Good job. <laughs> and you have this little baby, right? And you're holding it in your arms, and, and there's nothing you would want more than the best for that child. Here, look at what Paul says in chapter 2, verse 7. But we were gentle among you just as nursing mother cherishes her own children. And again in chapter 2, verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as how? As a father does his own children. And like a parent, even though he faced his own trials, he would rather suffer for the sake of his kids that they would be blessed. Parents, you been there? Where you've told your child where you're going is going to be cold because you looked at the forecast. And if you've told them once, you told them 50 times to bring a jacket, bring a beanie, bring some gloves. And so you are prepared and then you get there and you look over at them and you say, did you leave your jacket in the car? And they go, no. Well, where is it? I don't know. Did you bring one? No. <sighs> As a dad or a mom, you take off your jacket, put them around. Now who's shivering? You are. 
And you're going, for the sake of my child, I will endure this hardship so that you can be comforted. It's normal for any parent to do that. Paul says, I could endure this no longer. Now, some of you are old enough to remember the old school original Popeye the Sailor Man, right? I am too. On the radio, I was listening last month, and they said it was National Popeye the Sailor Man. And I thought, what is National Popeye the Sailor Man Day? What is that for? Is this another Hallmark thing where I got to buy a card, a Popeye card, trying to make money? They said it's Popeye the Sailor Day because it was his 95th anniversary. And I thought, dang, if he's 95 and I remember him, let's not think about that right now. Let's not think about that. But do you remember all the stories were the same of Popeye the Sailor Man? Right? He would be getting kicked around by Bluto or Brutus, depending on the era you watched. Olive oil would be in peril. And then what would Popeye the Sailor Man say? That's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. The little tune would kick on. He'd pop out his can of spinach, crush it with his bicep, go up into the air, go down to his belly, up to his head, and his forearms would pop out, and he would take care of business. <laughs> Strong to the finish, because he ate his spinach. <laughs> when he came to the point where he couldn't take it anymore, he had to do something. Everything has a capacity rating. Imagine not having social media. Praise God for that. No internet. Little quiet. No cell phone. Oh, now we're talking a little different, aren't we? They had none of that. They couldn't get online and find out how they were doing. They couldn't track the phone, right, like I do with my kids. And make sure you're coming home. I got my son good one time. I said, oh, yeah, I saw you went by the old house. Like our old house where we used to live, I pulled him up and I was like, oh, what's he doing? Joyriding, right? He's going to the old neighborhood. He looks at me and I looked at him like, I know where you are. I know where you are. But none of that existed. You had to just pray and hope that these believers who so earnestly came to the gospel were okay. That was his threshold, his breaking point. Don't raise your hand because I already know that every single one of us has things we can't stand. Whether you're out somewhere and somebody's playing the music too loud at the beach and they set up a speaker about that size right next to you and it's thumping and bumping and you're just trying to enjoy the scenery and you can't hear a conversation and your thresholds start to rise to where you get up and you walk over and in the name of Jesus, you calmly and politely ask them to turn the music down, right? It's a threshold. It's a capacity. But think about this. Think through this with me this morning. Who's the focus of things I can't stand? Whose betterment is it for? A lot of times it's me. It's me. Here Paul is saying, when, when it comes to something I couldn't take, it has to do with other people. When I know a brother or a sister is struggling it keeps me up at night. I have to make a call. I have to send a text. We just need to go over there and stop by and see if anybody is home. When somebody else is struggling, do we say that's tragic, but I don't want to get involved? That's hazardous. That's toxic. That might affect me. I got plans later. I got things to do. Are we okay with that if it's somebody else as long as it doesn't affect us? Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. He said, if others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Notice what he says here. We endure all things. So when it came to himself... He could endure anything, suffering, persecution. I'll endure it for the sake of the gospel. But when it comes to you, my brothers and sisters, I can't handle it. I can't take it. Such a heart and such a genuine affection for other people. This affection 
turned into such a concern for them that it turned into action. And it said that true love is selfless and gives itself away in sacrificial service to others. It does more than, brother, I've heard you having a hard time. I'll pray for you. Let's go. We got to get to Chipotle for lunch. What if you told that brother or that sister, hey, we're going out to lunch. Why don't you just come sit with us? I think part of the problem is we think we have to do something. We go, I don't know how to fix that. You're not the fixer. Christ is the fixer. You just have to be there. And have you ever done that or somebody's done that for you where they've just come over, they've sat with you, they've taken you a meal, they've paid for a meal. Maybe they just accompanied you in a tough situation. They didn't say much, but they were just there for you. And then you say, man, that person was really there for me. It meant a lot. Or somebody tells you, man, you really came through for me. Your love for me was so strong. And you're saying, I just bought you lunch. That's the beauty of it is that it doesn't take much to show this genuine affection for people. Paul was willing to do without so that they could have. In 1 John 3 verse 18, the New Living puts it this way, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let's show the truth by our actions. So he says, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone to be left in Athens alone. This, he says, is good. How many times when we suffer loss do we say, this is good? This is good. No, we say, this is bad. We like these words. What about me? Where's mine? How come they? And then when you really fall into it, you start using these all-inclusive words like, Never, always, I never, they always. Watch out for that. This word good in the Greek is interesting. It means not merely an understanding of what is right and good, but it's stressing the willingness and freedom of an intention to resolve regarding what is good. Bottom line, it means this, being willing to do what's best no matter what. We've been in situations like that where there's been a group of people and somebody has to do it and it's obvious in your mind that it's really going to not be pleasant. But it's also obvious in your mind that you're the most qualified and best person to do it. So what do you do? Do you say, oh, I'm going to take one for the team here and I'm going to do what's best because what's best for me and what I consider good is best for the situation and good for everybody else. Living this selfless life. And something special happens when somebody knows that you are sacrificially giving them your best. Paul was willing to give this up. This word when he says we're willing to be left behind, it's the word used for when somebody passes away and we leave them behind. He's saying, I'm willing to risk a death of my benefits having my associates close to me to sacrifice that for you. I am willing to be abandoned and forsaken that you guys might be comforted and encouraged. And he said this to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. I will very gladly do this, not begrudgingly, but I'm happy to pour myself out and suffer loss for the sake of our souls. And I'm convicted that far too much of the time, I'm most concerned about how everything is going to affect me. When the phone rings and I see that number and I go, oh boy, I got time for this right now, right? Maybe it's your mom or your dad or, or a child. And it's like, every time they call, they always want money. Every time they call, they always want money. I'm not answering it. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. They need to be taught a lesson. But then when you're in a situation, How come you didn't answer my call? Why didn't you pick up on the phone? I I was in need. I forgot my wallet. Why didn't you help me out? Watch out for that double standard where we can get so focused on ourselves. Do we have this genuine affection for God's people, for our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord? John MacArthur says, strong affection always leans to sacrifice. 
Love gives itself away for its objects. Selfless commitment to meet others' needs is the measure of the true care for others. So what does Paul do? He sends his most beloved son in the faith, Timothy. He's willing to give up that comfort, that minister, that companionship. I will be abandoned, forsaken. I will die to that and let him go for your sake, that we can find out how you're doing and also he can continue to minister because the ministry was got cut short. So there's three things he says here about Timothy. When he says, notice, Timothy, our brother. Timothy, our brother. What does that mean? That means Timothy was saved. And if you're genuinely going to help somebody and lead them to truth, you can't do anything without Jesus first in your life. You can't help somebody unless you've been helped. You can't share good news unless you've received. You can't lead somebody to a place you haven't been. You can't give what you don't have. So if you're not saved and you're seeking to bless, you need to come to Christ first to get what's necessary to truly bless. So he doesn't overlook that. But he says, remember, Tim's in it too. He's our brother, Timothy, our brother. The second thing he says is that Timothy is a minister of God. This simply means servant. Now, the word minister is often gotten glorified, right? Often lifted up, often treated specially. Here it simply means a servant. The word in the Greek is like a table waiter. Somebody who comes and what's their job and concern? You. How are you folks today? What do you normally say? Good. Every once in a while we'll say, how are you? What can I do for you today? Do you want me to come back in a minute? Do you still need it longer to decide? Right? We'd be like, hey, you've been here 10 minutes. You should have this figured out right now. You're costing me money. (laughs) But no, it's this minister. It's this servant. Timothy's just a servant. He's willing to go. The third thing he says is that he's the fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Timothy was a team player. He didn't have to be the one to call the shots. He didn't have to be the one to run the show. It wasn't about him, but he was doing everything for the glory of God. Listen to how Paul describes Timothy, because Paul was in the habit of sending Timothy to different churches. Listen to what he says to him in Philippians chapter 2. He says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character. That as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Paul is willing to let his son go, to give it up for the sake of these believers. And he is so dear to him. Imagine this. I have nobody else like him on my team but you can have them. You can take them because it's going to be good. It's going to be necessary. It's going to be best for you, even though I'm going to suffer. And even Timothy himself was not a robot. He was a person. And when you read the language that Paul wrote to Timothy in first and second Timothy, the last two books Paul wrote were to this man. That's how dear he was to him. And in that letter, when you read those epistles, you can see between the lines the person of Timothy. Paul says things like, Tim, when we were together, I remember your frequent tears. Tim was tearful. He says, you were timid. Don't hold back, Timothy. Stir up the gift that was in you. Remember the faith of your mother and your grandmother. I'm confident it's in you, too. You had hands laid on you by the church. Wage war by the prophecies concerning you. Fight the good fight. Timothy was timid. Timothy was physically ill. Paul said, hey, don't only drink water, but sometimes have a little wine for your frequent ailments. So you look at this guy, Timothy, who is Paul's right-hand man, and you're looking at this guy going, he's fearful, he's timid, he's physically sick, maybe because he's so scared all the time, it's affecting his tummy. This is the guy who's going? The answer is yes, yes. God is not looking for gifted people, qualified people, people who have it all together, people who can wax eloquent and know all the answers. He's looking for somebody genuine and available who's willing to be sent and go bless people. And Timothy did that job. He did it. Timothy was to do, excuse me, more than just find out how they're doing. Sneak in at night, Timothy, see if they're okay and come back. No, he was to stay there. 
not just get the information back, but he was to stay and help establish them. Listen to Paul's pattern here outlined for us in Acts chapter 14. It says in verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned, meaning they had already been there, to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying this, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. You need an encouraging word this morning? You're going through an affliction and a tribulation? You're on the road to the kingdom, saint. How do I know? Because he said it's through many tribulations. That's how you enter. Jesus would say, what's the road? It's narrow. What's the, what's the way? It's narrow. The gate is narrow. And he would say it's hard. And some translations say difficult. So if you look down, you find yourself on easy street. And you take out the tape measure and you measure the distance of the path. And it's very wide. And it seems cozy. And a lot of people are on it. You're not going to like the destination. The wide road doesn't lead to the narrow gate. The narrow gate leads to the eternal destination. And anything suffered on that narrow road is not worthy to be compared to the ultimate destination. When you reach that, you won't even mention it. So Timothy was supposed to do two things here. Two things when he came to them. He was supposed to encourage them. And he was supposed to establish them. This word establish in the Greek, it means to set fast to turn resoutly to a certain direction, to confirm, to steadfastly set the mind to strengthen. Now, where we live, we live on the end of a cul-de-sac, and it's got what's called a, a pie-shaped lot, right? It's like a piece of pizza or a piece of pie. The, the front of it's really narrow, but the back of it's super long. And we have a fence that goes over 200 feet across our backyard. So yeah, when it blew over, all I saw was dollar signs flying out of my pocket, right? <laughs> And as I pulled this fence out, I inspected that the people who had built it previously took shortcuts, right? Some of the posts didn't even have cement. They weren't even pressure treated. So every time the wind would blow, this thing would tip over and I'd pick up one section. It looked like a funny video. I'd go over to this section, that section would tip down. And I'd go over this, thing. this thing was so propped up by stilts, man. It was unbelievable. And finally, I had to replace it. I had to replace this fence because I was tired of fixing it all the time. So I went to the depot and I looked at all the posts and I said, which ones are the strongest ones? I got online and say, how do you build a fence? What's the strongest way? You dig deep. You put rock down first for drainage. You tap it down. Not one bag, not two bags. Let's use three bags of cement. These posts are going nowhere. <laughs> Rails, pickets, screws, stain. My fence was built upon the rock. So that when the torrents came, and they did, when the wind blew as those Santa Anas can, my fence was strong because we took the time to establish it. Paul is telling Timothy, these people, because of the hostility, have the temptation to be blown all over the place. And they might get blown so hard that they might fall. But I need you to come to dig down, to minister to them the word of God, to help them understand the truths in scripture so that they can weather the storm. Strong faith is the result of knowing all that God has revealed and has a firm foundation in sound doctrine. It's like this. You have a biblical worldview. Everything you see in the world, including the person you look at in the mirror, every situation, every circumstance, you see through the lens of scripture. And when you do that and God's word becomes more true and more real than anything else, it firms you up, it grounds you deep, and you will stand strong in the test of affliction. The second thing Timothy was supposed to do was encourage them. Interesting word in Greek. It's a lot like the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Called near to one side for help and aid, the act of being greatly helped. Coming alongside, motivating them to endure affliction and live out sound doctrine. Now, one time, I was going for a run. And I looked at the forecast, and it wasn't supposed to rain till later. But as I started to run, just, just barely getting out there, and I was going on a long run, right? Long enough, long for me. Like, I, I wouldn't even be able to see my house. Okay, that's the thing, no. I wasn't just going down to the end of the block this time. I was going to be away for a while, right? And it starts to rain a little bit. 
And a little bit of machismo I have in me, that manliness goes, it's just water. I take a shower every night. What's the difference? Let's just get wet. So you progress out, you know, mile one, mile two, mile three, mile four. You're still going away. And it just starts to dump rain, okay? And my spirit starts to dump also. And everything in my body is telling me, you are a moron for believing that you can get in shape. You should stop right now. You have your phone. Go into that store. Call your wife. She'll come pick you up. Take the easy way out. You shouldn't have to endure this. And yet I kept running and I got slower and slower and slower till some guy rolls down his window and yells at me. True story. He says, that's commitment. <laughs> running in the rain. And I was like, it scared me for a second. And then somebody else comes and says, you got this, man. Keep going. And people are driving by, honking their horns, giving the thumbs up. And see, here's the thing I realized later. I thought these people were very encouraging. No, I probably looked like death. And they were like, I better say something to this guy or we're going to have to call 911. <laughs> I'm running in the rain. But something interesting happened. From the first coming, I was like a ship with his sail up, dead in the wind. But when I got that first wind of encouragement, a little bit of wind started to feel the sail. I stood up a little taller. When somebody else honked or yelled and said, you got this, I was moving by the time I got the last encouragement. I come in the driveway with chariots of fire music blazing, like, this is legit. My wife's like, how was it? Did you get wet? I said, I'm dripping. Yeah, but that was the best run you know, I ever had. What made the difference? Somebody encouraged me, keep going. It's worth it. Don't give up. Timothy, go to these people. Dig deep and establish them as their minds are, tend to wander to quit and give up. Tell them, no, don't do it. It's true. It's a little affliction and a little bit of hostility. But in the long term, it's going to be so worth it. And we have so many people these days that are deconstructing their faith. What, what is that? That's idolatry from a mental standpoint when your thoughts are now the chisel and the hammer that are not forming an idol made of stone, but an idealistic model that somehow through your reasoning, you can unwind the truth of the gospel, say you don't believe it anymore, and then somehow you think that truth ceased to exist and goes away? What a mental gymnastic to fool yourself. In reality, it's a moral issue because if you can explain it away, then you don't have to submit to the master and lordship of the creator. Now you can become the master of your own ship, and now you feel better about doing the things you do. Deconstructing, oh my gosh. Lord, please construct. Continue to build as a wise and master builder. So Timothy's mission was to strengthen them, to establish them. That leads us to our second point this morning. Our second point this morning. Enduring affliction in verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. That no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know. Now, the word shaken here is an interesting one in the Greek. The word shaken means the wagging of a dog's tail. And you guys got dogs? Yeah, how many, how many tails? Unless you cut it off or it's a special breed or something. But that dog, that tail wags. Right? My dog, Cooper, is a total beggar. He comes into the kitchen, and you can hear him because you hear his tail against the cupboard. Boom, 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 boom. And he knows, like, if you open a bag or open, like, a Tupperware, he knows that sound. And he comes. But he also knows, because he's trained, that I'm the alpha of the house. Me, Tarzan, he, Jane. That's the way this works. And I just point to him like that. And he's, he's just like a little child. He puts his head down and he shrinks back. And I trained him two words, move on. And he knows that means go away, get out of the kitchen, because he's been on the counter before as a pup. And I ain't having that no more. You can be in the house, but in my rules, right? This is how this is going to go down. 
So he backs up sheepishly, and I just point and say, move on. And he goes into the other room, right? That, that tale, a lot of people have made inference of it, that it relates to something. And I think it's more simple than that. What it simply means is that a dog's tail moves frequently, and it moves at anything. And he's saying, don't, don't wag like that. If you want to draw any correlation, how about the metaphor, don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't let the circumstance, as difficult as it is, control what I believe about God. Amen. Keep the main thing the main thing. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So he wanted them not to be moved in any circumstance that the tail would never wag the dog. And he says this, you know that we were appointed for this. We were appointed for this. Remember Acts 14, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. In fact, he would tell Timothy in those personal letters at the end in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So Paul didn't preach a user-friendly gospel. Paul didn't take the bad and set it aside and just preach the good. When Christ comes, you're going to have love, you're going to have joy, you're going to have peace. And the rest of your earthly life is going to be smooth sailing. Anybody want to come to Jesus? Those are the people who come to Christ under half the story. And then they say this, that didn't work for me. That didn't work. I have lots of problems still. But here he's saying, when I was with you, I told you about the afflictions to suffer. That was embedded in his gospel presentation. The good news of Jesus Christ includes the sufferings of Christ. You can't get around it. But also to the recipient, you are going to suffer also. Notice how he says, I told them when I was with you, and that was only three weeks, that trials and testings that come into our lives as Christians, they're not accidents, but they're appointments. We have been appointed for this. Here are a few things. I just picked five this morning for the sake of time to show you the blessing of what afflictions do in the life of a believer. There are many more in scripture. I'm just going to pick five of the main ones. First one of the blessings that affliction can bring is it builds your endurance and makes you stronger. It builds your endurance and makes you stronger. James 1, 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, endurance, or perseverance. But let patience have its perfect work. He doesn't say get happy when bad things happen. No, but he says internally have joy knowing that God is going to use this to produce something and strengthen you just like a run. When you're out there and you're suffering and it's not pleasant or a bunch of weights or maybe you've tried to heal a relationship and it's taking work and it's encountering trials and they're building in you something you can't see at the time. But if you stick with it over the long term, you will be made stronger. Have you ever decided to go on a diet and then get on the scale that night and see how it's going? <laughs> you're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe I should stop trying. Maybe I should start training. Maybe I shouldn't try to eat healthy. Maybe I should just train and enjoy the process. Pass by the fast food section. Go over to the produce section. And choke down some vegetables each day. And you watch over time what happens. You don't see it, but it happens. The same thing with growth. When you go through afflictions... They strengthen you and make you stronger. Number two, it purifies you and makes you genuine. You are purified and made more genuine. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is God's got this pot and he's thrown you in it in the season and it feels like the heat is getting cranked up to the point where it's unbearable. But you know who's got his hand on the dial? God does. God's controlling the simmer. 
right? God doesn't have any uncontrolled burns. They're all divinely appointed for the believer. And God knows that when that consuming process happens, that which can burn will. The things in us that are of us will be slowly removed. And then that which is in us, which is imperishable, Christ will be more refined. We will born like Jesus. And you've seen in those seasoned saints that have been through difficult times, there's just something about them. There's a genuineness and authenticity that you can't fake. You can't buy in a store. You can't even go to a class to learn. But you've got to go through the fire to get that kind of character. It makes you pure and it makes you more more genuine. Number three, it keeps our hope fixed on heaven. It keeps our hope fixed on heaven. Romans 8.18 says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. When you're going through a difficult time, you can realize that it's only a time. When you're going through a different season, you can realize it's just a season. Some people, when you're in the middle of the trial, your favorite verse is, it came to pass. That's it. It came to pass. When you're here on earth and you're suffering, you can thank God that this isn't how it's always going to be. That my hope is now in heaven because there's coming a day where none of this will be present. There'll be no sin. There'll be no darkness. There'll be no shadow. There's not even a sun in heaven because the lamb is the light and his glory shines over all. And we're perfective. So next time you go through a trial, you can say, amen for heaven. Amen for heaven. And Jesus says, enter into my what? My rest. My rest. The alleviation from all your pain, from all your suffering, from all your trials. You will enter into that rest. Number four, it makes our ministry more effective. It makes our ministry more effective. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So when you go through something, you gain this experience of God's faithfulness and it's happened time and time again for me. And I know you could say the same thing is true, that you encounter somebody else who's just starting the trial of what maybe you're well into or have gone through. And you can say, come here, young man, sit down for a minute. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you about what God did for me. My ministry is more effective because I can be more relatable to people when the doctor comes and tells them, I'm sorry, but it's cancer. And you've gone through that. And you can weep with somebody who weeps in a genuine way that is so effective that you can't get unless you've gone through the trial. Listen to what this quote says from page 166 of the book, Sufferings and the Sovereignty of God. It says, when you've passed through your own fiery trials and found God to be true to what he says, you have real help to offer. You have firsthand experience of both his sustaining grace and his purposeful design. He has kept you through the pain, not from the pain, notice, but through the pain. And he has reshaped you more into his image. What you are experiencing from God, you can give away in increasing measure to others. You are learning both the tenderness and the clarity, necessity, clarity necessary to help sanctify another person's deepest distress. Wow. Ultimately, number five. It will bring us to heaven. It's going to bring us to heaven. Of all the afflictions that stack up in life, guess what? There's a last one. There's one at the end of the list, and it's going to be done. And when you breathe that last breath and you're done on earth, the body will separate from the soul. The body, like an old tent or like a garment, the Bible says, where you're done with it and you roll it up and you throw it in the trash. You're done with that. Its useful purpose is over. But the spirit, your soul, goes before the Lord. The last trial will usher you into heaven. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption 
and this mortal must put on immortality, so that when the corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying, death is swallowed up in victory. And what a glorious day when we go to heaven. That's why we celebrate. Although we mourn, we don't mourn as people who have no hope, but every one of us will depart from this world barring the Lord Jesus Christ return. One out of one, 10 out of 10 pass. Nobody gets out of here alive in the body, but in the soul, we never die. Therefore, we don't fear it. We don't fear it. All that being said, it's not heaven till it's heaven. We still got some narrow road ahead of us, barring the rapture, which I'm cool if God comes before the Super Bowl. I don't mind missing any of that. I won't go any further. Except there's no football on today, so there you go. The whole reason for him not being able to take it anymore is he thought because he didn't know. I wonder if they gave in. I wonder, I wonder if they got tempted. And so he just had to send Timothy. And he's reminding them that these trials are God-ordained so that the new believers wouldn't, wouldn't equate them with God's disapproval, right? You remember being young in the faith, maybe some of you are there and things are going wrong and you think, man, what am I doing wrong? Or you think, maybe this isn't real because this is all happening. No, 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 no. It's a part of the package. This leads us to our third point this morning, which is resisting, tempting, apostasy, or another way to say that is resisting the temptation to fall away. Notice what he says in verse 5. Lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. The tempter here is Satan. And he has a means to tempt you the same way he tempted Eve in the garden. Why? Because it works. And it worked back then. To say, has God really said? Did God really say in the day you eat you shall surely die? Eve. Eve, girlfriend, you are lucky I'm here today. Let me tell you what God really is holding out from you. God knows this. Shh, keep it secret. In the day you eat, you're going to be made like him. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want the competition. He wants to be God challenging his goodness and his love. And that can happen also, when people go through trials, this temptation to quit because it gets hard was Paul's number one greatest concern for the church. When he lists there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, all the things that he suffers, and he talks about the beatings, he talks about the shipwrecks, he talks about the persecutions, he talks about the hunger, he talks about the sleepless night, and he says, you know what's worse than all of it? My daily concern for all the churches that somehow the things that they are going through, they're going to fall into a temptation to deconstruct, to move away from the faith. In the parable of the sower, when Jesus gave it, his disciples came and asked him privately, what's the meaning of the parable? And I'm glad they did because it's recorded in scripture. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 and 21, Jesus explains what the seed that landed on the stony soil means. He says, but he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root within himself, but endures for only a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, he immediately stumbles. This was Paul's fear. So, excuse me. So you have a situation you go through, an affliction that's happened in your life, and it's so real to you that it's like it's a dream that you can't get out of. It's like a movie you're casting and starring in with the character, though, in the script that you don't want. But yet it's so real, you can't wake up. You can't turn it off. You can't switch channels. You can't even press pause because it's coming. And so you have this thing you're going through. And on one side, you know, this is, this is God testing me. He's making me stronger. All the five things we talk about. He's making me pure. He's making me genuine. He's getting my hope on heaven. Could this be the one where he finally takes me and I make it? I don't know. But then on the other side, there's the devil tempting you, saying, just give up. Just quit. 
deconstruct. You know it's not true. Has God really said? Challenging and challenging and challenging. So Paul understands that this temptation to fall away would be very real for them. So a lot of people ask, is this, the, is this God or is this the devil? Well, the answer is, yeah, but God's in control of it. God is in control of it. The devil's there trying to tempt you, but we need to understand that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and all authority has been given to us in heaven and on earth. And when you find those situations, you just have to tell them it's proper place. Get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. The Lord rebuke you, it says in the book of Jude. And you have to do that again and again and again, as many times as it takes to encourage your soul and get your mind right. You will come out the other side because the lie is you won't make it. God says he are kept by the power of God, the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last day. Saying you're going to make it because God promised it. You are going to make it because God promised it. So finishing up this morning, Paul says he would have considered the, the whole thing a wash. We would have labored in vain if, if you give up. That's how serious he thought about this. So as we go to communion this morning, I want to give you Three questions to think about this week. Number one, are you most concerned about yourself or do you put others first? Think about that. Number two, how can knowing affliction is coming help you get through it? How knowing that it's coming, it's a part of the package, how does it help you get through it? And number three, what should you tell someone who's about to walk away from the faith because of hard times? Perhaps you've encountered people. Let's pray together as the worship team comes forward. Father, we come to you this morning in prayer, asking for strength to apply these things. Lord, we all go through difficult seasons, but help us to know that the words of affection that the apostle displayed to those believers are a mere reflection of the affection that you displayed for us at the cross. That while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Lord. That we were lost without hope, you came and you saved and you offer the free gift of salvation that all who are willing may come and have their sins forgiven. That at that day, God, that happens for all of us when our soul is separated from our body and it's time for us to stand before you. Will we have been forgiven? Will we have acknowledged truth? Because the stark thing, Lord, is that you say once we get to that point, the choice is over. Life can seem so fleeting sometimes. It can seem so short. It can even seem so worthless, but yet it's so important because the decisions we make now impact eternity. So I just want to ask in closing with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to come to Jesus this morning and you don't know him, slip up your hand real quick where I can see it. Slip up your hand if you want to acknowledge Jesus this morning. Anybody online, if you're listening, amen, I see you sitting right there, sister. Halfway down, praise God for that. Anybody online, if you want to click that button that says, I want to receive Christ, I see you in the front row over there, amen. On the right, you two right next to her. Praise God in the back, yeah, amen. You two in the back, sister. Praise God, you too, sir. I see you, brother, amen. If you want to give your life to Christ today, the Bible says whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. You have to acknowledge that you're a sinner and have fallen short. Be willing to turn from your ways and not be perfect, but just continue to believe in and follow Jesus. Simply say to God something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Would you forgive somebody even like me? Make me your child. Help me to know the concern that you have for your children is genuine, pure, and will never fail. Lord, keep me, keep me, because I can't keep myself. I trust in you this day, Jesus, for my salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. As we go to communion, let's take the time to just reflect on some of these things that the prototype was Jesus. You want to talk about somebody who had genuine affection? You want to talk about somebody who endured affliction? who resisted the temptation. If there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. That's the cup that he took that we're going to celebrate. As we enter into communion, we'll be back up in a minute. We're going to pass it here. So let's worship. 
Let's reflect on Christ's love and his sacrifice, and then we'll partake of the Lord's Supper together. The Bible says that he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Lord, we thank you that your body was willing to be broken on our behalf, that the Father might be glorified in bringing sinners to repentance and calling them sons and daughters. We thank you for your tremendous sacrifice. And in the same way, after he had given thanks, he said, this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And when you do that, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Lord, we thank you for your precious blood that was shed as a sacrifice that was enough to forgive us. And we are redeemed. We partake of that now. And Lord, we praise you for your tremendous sacrifice. And for the people who said they want to come to know you, we pray that they would respond and grow and disciple, that they would be established and encouraged here at Calvary Chapel Beaumont. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. And if you're here today and you made a decision for Christ, come talk to us. There'll be some people up front that want to talk to you. If you're online, please click that button. And let's stand again and let's worship our Savior as we close. God bless you.
day when heaven was filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came for to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed living he loved me dying he saved die on the tree suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sin my redeemer is he the hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me living he loved me dying he saved For those of you that prayed to receive Jesus today, come down front. We've got some uh, packets to give you, Bible and everything.